it reminds me of those terrible pieces of art where it's like, like Harriet Tubman and Rosa Parks and they play in spades at a table with fucking Barack Obama and Michelle Obama and all this bullshit and Tupac is in the back. Dinner all of This episode, we're talking about asexual birds living the best lives. You niggas, and that's the bird singing to other birds. Yes. Um, data surveillance uh, as HIV intervention, and the advocates challenging the practice. A win, oh, a win for intersex youth in Austin, Texas, and what would happen if Harriet Tubman's descendants were BBL bad bitches, and much more. <laughs> Our first segment today is called Animals Do Be Gay, though. It's typically a segment where we acknowledge and discuss the diverse sexual identities of animals, but today, it's not gay. It's a little different. What's going on, Akua? <laughs> Animals do be having immaculate conception. Though. That's what it's <laughs> called. <laughs> Um, and we want to shout out one of our patrons, Britt, for sharing this story with us and our community channel on Slack. Thank you for putting this on our radar. Thank you, Britt. Um, so basically, scientists have discovered that female condors can reproduce without a male partner Love in it. a rare phenomenon known as partheno parthenogenesis. Thank you. <laughs> I was just going to sigh like y'all know I don't know <laughs> Parthenos song. <laughs> Parthenos, you know damn what. <laughs> um, and parthenogenesis is a form of reproduction in which an egg can develop into an embryo without being fertilized by a sperm. Mm. So if you don't know what a condor is, because I didn't know what a condor was, <laughs> um, it is a really large bird. I don't think I actually looked up what it looked at what it looks like. Sam, can you pull that up on screen? Yeah, I can pull that up. Because in my head, I'm looking at a vulture, and I know it ain't a vulture. So. <laughs> hold um, on, <laughs> hold on, hold on. Images. It looks very similar to a vulture to me. Like okay. this white man next to this bird. I know this is sending me. Okay, hold on. Uh, <laughs> open image and new tab. Yeah, okay. Okay, there's a big share screen. I do a Google Chrome. There we go. So that's a condor yeah okay see that's what i saw in the article that's why i think it's a vulture my mind had to it looks like it, a vulture it. this nigga's uh, got to be related in some type of way okay <laughs> um so yeah um that is a condor and it is one of the or the largest bird um in north no in california not in okay california, but california that's not the biggest bird in all of north america there's no, motherfuckers bigger than that there's niggas bigger than that where <laughs> I don't know how oh, in yeah. the wilderness the best. <laughs> yeah, that's not the point of this segment. <laughs> You're not an ornithologist. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> um, so we want to go into how science has discovered this. So because white people will be doing what white people be doing, <laughs> they put condors, condors have been endangered for centuries. Uh -huh. So as European, or European, Europe, I don't know where it's Europeans, haha, mm -hmm. as Europeans settled and moved out west, they shot, poisoned, captured, killed, oh, condors, no. collected their eggs, and reduced their natural food supplies of like antelope, elk, buffalo, and whatnot. Wait, hold on, these niggas was eating elks? Some niggas <laughs> eating elks, bitch. These see, are the you most see how gangster birds. <laughs> you saw how big this nigga was? <laughs> That shit's squaring up with, like, with his wings and shit. Wow. Okay. Um. So yeah, white people doing what they do, taking over people's territories and disenfranchising animals and all. Yes. <laughs> yes. The condors um were close to extinction. Um. In 1982, there was only 22 of them niggas left. Oh my god. How do you reduce a population of something to 22? White people know how. White I mean it's whole it's whole Native American tribes that just don't exactly exist anymore, so that don't <laughs> exist anymore because white people know how to do it. They've created a science subject. genocide. I, like, um so in in the 1980s, a state-led recovery program um in California began to work to bring the species back um, and have successfully bred the animals back from the brink of, um, of non-existence. Um, and in doing so, they were DNA testing the animals to determine like familial relationships so that they weren't then inbreeding the birds. Uh, because inbreeding does not allow for genetic longevity 
longevity. Like eventually there are physical and uh, genetic and medical problems. So they were DNA testing the birds to make sure that they were not like inbreeding too close to siblings or whatnot. Um, with that, with that data set of the DNA testing, scientists decided that they were going to do a complete genetic analysis of the current population of condors, which is about 900 birds. Why did they want to do that? They have free time. I'm, I'm assuming they have free time. Cause I do. Who does this thing on this podcast where she hates scientists doing things <laughs> that make them happy. And I actually love scientists doing things that make them happy. Because there are things we can be doing that can make there is an abundance happy. of wealth, nigga. There is an abundance of wealth. Okay, <laughs> you don't got to be taken away from this condor study. Oh, and okay, that's fine. <laughs> so, so they like, decided so you niggas don't solve cancer. You're like, I'm, no, so I'm not studying now. cancer. I'm not doing that. That's not my job. <laughs> And you know what? Fine, fine. <laughs> okay, they did this whole analysis. They, they did this whole analysis, and it was during this analysis that they identified two male chicks out of the population that were that had no genetic re- relation to any other male condor in the pack. So they were at the San Diego Zoo. They thought that there was a, a mama condor and a papa condor, and they were like, "No, this has to be your daddy." But then DNA testing said, "You don't got none of his DNA." Maury said, "You are <laughs> yeah, not the like, father." On the weirdest episode of Maury, <laughs> <laughs> it's like if it's between Tyrone and Dwayne, neither of you are the father, and they fucking run to the back. They're like, oh, "Exactly, how we did it. We got to dab each other out." Like, exactly. God stepped um, in. <laughs> And so they ran the data again, they ran the data again to make sure like it wasn't human error. And they were like, no, these, these birds were born without the help of a male condor. It was just their mama. She was like, you know what, fuck it, I got this. I'm yeah, not it. my good sis saying I'll do it myself. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, good sis had already birthed or reproduced other condors with Asexually? males. So it wasn't oh, okay. like she had to. Oh. No, she didn't. She didn't reproduce asexually before. Okay. She has had sexual reproductive children or whatever uh-huh. um, with the male condor before. So it's not like she had to. Mm-hmm. It was an instance, but she was like, I'm tired of this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm motherfucking tired. Do not look at me. Don't breathe near me. But you know what? These scientists want some kids. So I'm going to do it. Hell. <laughs> it had to be. She was tired. She Shout was out tired. to a grown woman who don't need no man. Okay. <laughs> We love um, independent so bitches. That's my explanation of what happened, but scientists don't know why it happened. <laughs> they don't, uh, they yeah, don't know yeah. why it happened. They don't know. Well, they know exactly when it happened because the birds were born and they have um, ages, mm-hmm. but um, they don't know how it happened. They don't know why it happened or how to track if it'll happen again. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, those two male chicks um, died before they oh, were sexually no. reproductive, before they were aged. They were like, produced. Sexually, yeah, sexually mature. And so they weren't even able to like then see if they had offspring, what would that be like? Mm. Um, But But I do wonder if the female condor who did give birth, because she's reproduced before, if she has another female descendant, maybe that person also has that genetic trait that makes it feasible or allows her to do that asexual reproduction. You you write into them, Sammy. You let them know that that makes it possible. (laughs) They're like, who the fuck is this bitch? (laughs) Yeah, we considered that, Sam. Thank you. <laughs> or they're like, oh, you, you want to work on our honey. study? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, That's that very interesting. A, um, that is a almost before Christmas story. You know, here is immaculate conception happening in the wild. Shout out to Mary. That's cool. That was fun. That's a win. I think this is like a wins episode. Yeah, this is not a <laughs> this is not that much of a sad episode um, until we get into this shit. OK, so it's uh, there. Our next segment is fuck is this? I'm not playing the bumps because I don't want my uh, audio to cut out as it does sometimes. But mm-hmm. this segment is fuck is this? It's a moment to discuss, rant about or laugh at the nonsense in the realm of sex, love and or dating, typically on the Internet. And today we've got a tweet and a response to a tweet. Let me see if I can pull up the response. To the t- okay, there it is. Good. I'm glad this motherfucker didn't delete it. Let me just open it in another tab so I can kind of shift between these easily. All right. <clears throat> so this is kind of cool because I saw this tweet before it went viral. I saw it when it had like 10 likes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I knew it was going to blow up. All right. No, I didn't know. Okay. So this tweet was tweeted by 
at the gist of freedom. Mm-hmm. I don't even know if this shit is true, bro. I don't believe nothing I see on Twitter these days, but <laughs> exactly. And I that. tried, I tried to look into it, but I didn't look that far into it. So maybe, <laughs> but at the gist of freedom tweeted a photo of Harriet Tubman's great nieces, Ava and Alita Stewart. I don't know what the fuck CA means. Akua? Circa. Oh, circa. Okay. Circa 1910 to 1914 via the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. <clears throat> And then um, it is a picture of two black, presumably women. Uh, They got some big ass church hats on. The waists are snatched, which comes into play a little bit later. Uh, Queen retweeted this and was like, they got that black girl head tilt. They do have that black girl head tilt, tilt. (laughs) shout out to Queen. Um, They just look like bad bitches. They just look like bad bitches. So when I saw this, I actually scrolled down because I was like, is somebody gonna prove whether this is real information or not? I am an asshole when it comes to the internet. Um, but then I saw a re- uh, reply who said, no BBL, just natural beauty in response to these uh, to circa 1910 era <laughs> women who are presumably Harriet Tubman's great nieces. Akua, thoughts on that? you got to be trolling me. You just have to. <laughs> Because we're at 1910 to 1914 where they supposed to get BBL. Where? Who's doctor? I I don't like it for many reasons, but I don't like it because yeah, there's no BBL, nigga. Uh, there's no BBL. And then somebody responded like, there was no BBL then. He was like, I'm aware. Uh, he said, no shit. But like, I would reason to say that today's BBL was yesteryear's corset exactly and women are clearly wearing corsets <laughs> like, clearly we're, and this is the uh, okay <laughs> so like when we go into beauty standards and the history of beauty standards like no woman's waist is that small exactly no. i mean on a rare rare occasion the 0.01 percent of human maybe might be shaped like that but, but no. these two <laughs> it's clearly that they have corseted themselves have put themselves in some type of construction they are strapped up and wrapped up under there you think waist trainers are bad they got it up to here so exactly do you think waist where do you think the origins of waist trainers come from they're corsets they are cheaper versions of corsets (laughs) yes this i don't want to say there's nothing i don't want to say that there is no natural beauty because they are beautiful women they bad Mm -hmm. bitches but like (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> and why are you doing this and just like to use <laughs> allegedly Harriet Tubman's nieces as like a way to pit black women of yesteryear to black women of well, this, of year. this year. if you don't shut the fuck <laughs> up and just go somewhere like yeah. the women of 1910 to 1940 beyond and even before then were applying things to their hair, their skin. They were doing things that were quote unquote, not natural to achieve a certain beauty standard, just as the women today. Yep. This is not new to 2020 or the 2000s. We've been doing it for centuries. Yep. Partially because the fuck we feel like it. And then also to navigate this thing called racism and like misogyny and misogynoir in this country and globally. (laughs) And so when you're tweeting about the fucking descendants of Harriet Tubman, you Tubman. especially should be thinking about that in mind. <laughs> but you gonna sit here. It reminds exactly. me of <laughs> they didn't get a Brazilian butt lift. How do you know? They don't got no fat transfers. You should be like them. The fuck? It reminds me of those terrible pieces of art where it's like, like Harriet Tubman and Rosa Parks and they playing spades at a table with fucking Barack Obama and Michelle Obama and all this bullshit and Tupac is in the back. Oh, I hate those pieces. <laughs> Why do y'all make that? And it, go- it goes viral, though. So I guess somebody's buying it. No, I need one of those in my house. I'm buying it because we love it. We love the, the foolishness of it all. Why? <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. Well, any more to say about that? Oh, tell them to go eat a dick. I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, get off the internet. Stop trolling me. I'm tired. Why you want to come here and raise my blood pressure? We were just trying to look at some bad bitches that might be related to another he bad. Could bitch. have done something useful in seeing whether or not this was misinformation. And, I'm trying to figure out if these are her real out. nieces. <laughs> no BBL, just vibes. Shut up. 
Shut up. All right. What's next? <laughs> Jeff H. Okay. Uh, up next, we're going to learn what the heck molecular HIV surveillance is. Akua thinks it's microchips in the fucking Pfizer vaccine. <laughs> it's not even microchips. <laughs> it's the Pfizer vaccine, people. Akua thinks it's 5G, niggas. You got 5Gs. <laughs> you got 5Gs in your blood veins. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually really just tiny cameras and the prep and the pep they give people. That's what it is. All right. Well, we're going to figure out what the fuck that is. But first, I got some shit to say. I got a lot of shit to talk about. Uh, it's not going to take that long. Just kidding. If anyone is interested in Inner Hall Uprising and trivia, if you are at the intersection of both of those interests, you can hang out with me and our other patrons this coming Wednesday night for a, oh, that's tonight. Haha. -ha, this drops on Wednesdays uh, for a classic round of trivia. So IHU patron trivia nights are always really fun and they definitely get heated. Two particular patrons are actually going head to head this week and it'll be a lot of fun <laughs> and there will be some drama, maybe a little bit of sexual tension. I don't know. <laughs> Something that I don't want to miss out on. Uh, and you might not want to miss out on it either. So to join the festivities, you can become a $2 and up patron by going to patreon.com slash inner uprising or by hitting the Patreon link in our bio. All right. Let's get into Fuck That, which is our current event segment. And today we're talking about the little tiny cameras that are in your prep HIV. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not talking about that. Okay. I did the misinformation. That was the best job. She got somebody's the real gonna, information. Somebody's going to clip that one moment and like send one it to the piece, Joe Rogan right? podcast. They got cameras in the pills. Anyway. All right. So this uh, segment is based off of a piece written in the, ma the science magazine Undark. It's called Advocates Challenge, the CDC's new effort to track HIV spread. It was written by Tynan Stewart, and I will put the link in the show notes so you can read the full thing. I'm just going to be picking out a couple of things to talk about here today on this podcast. Uh, so in short, this piece is about this uh, new, maybe like since 2016-ish, HIV data tracking method called mo molecular surveillance, uh, its implementation, and how advocates are challenging its implementation. So now I'm going to use this article, a different resource, and my own brain to try to explain what molecular surveillance is. And Aku is going to let me know whether or not it's cameras and or microchips in whatever. <laughs> All right. So uh, according to Undark, Molecular HIV surveillance makes it possible to identify emerging clusters of HIV before they would be detected through traditional testing and contract tracing. For example, if two people test positive for HIV but have no shared contacts, public health workers might conclude the cases are unrelated. But molecular analysis could show the cases are similar strains, suggesting they are linked by recent transmission. This suggests a larger outbreak is underway and that more resources should be dedicated to testing and contract tracing. The tool is used to identify groups of people called clusters in public health jargon where HIV is spreading quickly. So that's what it does, but it's not quite what it is. So I'm going to keep reading. So now I have a little bit more from AIDSMAP.com. According to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, molecular, molecular HIV surveillance is conducted only on, sorry, is conducted on clusters of genetically similar viruses and not on people. They emphasize that phylogenetic data is de-identified and that aggregate data from blood tests are compared to identify viruses that are genetically similar and grouped according to various factors, such as when infection occurred, geography, and by stage of infection. This approach forms one of the CDC's centra central pillars of, sorry, this approach forms one of the central pillars to the CDC's ending the HIV epidemic in the US. While molecular surveillance is used in combination with traditional epidemiological approaches such as partner notification, the CDC argues that traditional methods used in isolation are insufficient to quickly identify and intervene in instances of rapid viral spread within networks. Molecular HIV surveillance allows public health officials to identify rapidly growing networks of HIV tr transmission, often in instances where people are not well connected to care, such as in rural communities, migrant groups, or injecting drug users. The CDC is specifically interested in clusters where more than five new transmissions have occurred in the past year with less than 0.5% genetic variation. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Here's me 
doing a brief summary of it, which I might even be getting wrong. Uh, so my take is that viruses mutate and that that can be seen in the genetics of the strain. If public health officials observe a similar strain in multiple blood samples taken, they can identify an outbreak more quickly and more precisely than asking everyone to recall, let's say, the name of someone who they slept with or sharing needles, et cetera. And then they can use that information to zero in and start using traditional methods like contact tracing, testing, PEP, et cetera. No, you got it. That, so that's I what do I be pull. science communicating. <laughs> that's what I pull from it as well. So basically they are taking the blood samples, looking at it on a molecular or genetic level, um, or looking at the HIV strain of that person who tested positive, um, looking at a genetic and molecular level, and then comparing it or recording it to be able to track that amongst other people uh, a lot faster than, like you said, asking people to remember everybody that I slept with, shared a drug with, Yep, which makes sense because a lot of times you don't know exactly. or you don't want to say nothing. Exactly. And therein lies some of the concerns, I think. So one of the major cons or the first part of the concern is the lack of community engagement in the rollout. So I'll read a snippet from the Undark article, which was kind of funny to me, but also like it encapsulates this concern. It was in the summer of 2018 at a gathering in Indianapolis when Andrew Spieldenner, vice chair of the U.S. People Living with HIV Caucus, first heard the term molecular HIV surveillance. His reaction, he said, was something like, what the hell? It's very similar to Akua's reaction. Am I reaction when we first saw this article because we were like what the fuck is that man and we host a sex podcast uh so i mean we are not people living with hiv we're not hiv advocates but we host a sex podcast and the fact that that was like an unfamiliar term with us is kind of indicative of things and i think even more so the fact that andrew uh vice chair of the people living with hiv caucus okay. was like what the hell Albeit what like four years ago, but still this very like big term that sounds kind of scary being like, mm -hmm. what the hell kind of is indicative of the fact that there was a, lot, a gap in communication between the people who were doing the rollout and people living with HIV or who are tapped into that kind of space. So article continues, many advocates felt blindsided by the new prog program. <clears throat> The reality is this stuff rolled out before anybody who wasn't in the implementation process knew that it was rolling out, said Rhonda Goldfine, an attorney and executive director of AIDS Law Project of Pennsylvania. So then on top of the lack of community engagement in the rollout <clears throat> is the history of stigmatization and criminalization of people who are HIV positive. So a couple of more excerpts from the article. In the in India, how do you pronounce Indianapolis? Indianapolis? Oh, Indianapolis. Indianapolis. Okay. <laughs> that fucking extra A in there. It throws us off. <laughs> in the Indianapolis <laughs> conference room, advocates quickly began to fear the system intended to slow the spread of HIV. Uh, they, uh, they fear that it could be misused to help imprison people under HIV criminalization laws. These laws target people who don't disclose their HIV status to sexual partners, and they sometimes penalize actions that don't transmit the virus, like spitting. Sentences can be harsh, as many as 30 years in extreme cases. Many of these laws were passed in the late 80s and early 90s before the advent of effective antiretroviral therapy which today helps people manage HIV and keeps them from transmitting it. More than 20 states still have HIV specific statutes. I meant to look up which 20 states, but I didn't get a chance to, sorry. Uh, that criminalize or control behaviors. In July, Illinois became the second state in the nation to fully repeal its HIV criminalization statute. The first was Texas in 1994. And I was like, what? You niggas was doing that? A broken clock is right two times a day, okay? <laughs> Not the people who live in Texas, your legislators. That's the who legislators, we're beefing with. Um, yeah, through the Center for HIV Law and po Though the Center for HIV Law and Policy notes that it didn't stop people living with HIV from being prosecuted under other criminal laws, Michigan revised its laws in 2018 to protect people who are HIV positive, but use methods to reduce risk of transmission, such as antiretroviral antiretroviral therapy. Advocates also argue that the people most likely to be swept up in the surveillance system, including Black people, immigrants, sex workers, and people who use drugs, are also among the most heavily policed. The fears of criminalization for people are really real, says McKelland. Is that the same McKelland as before? I'm sorry, so. McKelland. No, nah, it's not. But I think 
this person's name is also Andrew because I was on their Twitter earlier and I followed them. Sorry, McKellen. Um, article continues, there are no universal protections to keep data away from law enforcement, says Brianna Diaz, policy director for Positive Women's Network USA, a, nas- a nationwide membership organization of women with HIV that is fiscally sponsored by the Progressive Nonprofit Movement Strategy Center. So then the CDC responds to such concerns. Um, the CDC itself maintains strict data protections and the genetic sequence data it receives is anonymized. But data held by state and local health departments have names attached and state privacy statutes vary widely. Mm-hmm. Fulton, the CDC spokesperson, said the agency began taking directly, sorry, began talking directly with HIV community members, organizations, and health departments about molecular data analysis as early as 2016. But not everybody knew about that because in 2018, Andrew was like, bitch, what the fuck is that? <laughs> so and I'm sure the CDC is fucking underfunded. So <laughs> I was like they might have tried and then it wasn't enough money to go around. Yeah. A perceived lack of consultation and community buy, bi- especially under the Trump administration, CDC. Oh particularly underfunded when it comes to HIV. Uh, Anyway, a perceived lack of consultation and community buy-in though has haunted the program and raised thornier issues about consent. The bottom line is that this is our physical body. This is our data that is being used without our consent. Spiel Denner said, while he and other advocates insist that people living with HIV must give affirmative approval for their molecular data to be analyzed, public health officials don't think this can be done without compromising the tool's effectiveness. Uh, so now we're getting to somebody named Ma- Ma- Makotov. Uh, I don't have the line with their first name in this, sorry, so they will just be known as Makotov. I completely agree with the community's concern about this. Makotov said, but she said disease surveillance cannot be done successfully by a consent process because if you don't have reports of everybody who's diagnosed, you can't do prevention, you can't do the work that you need to do. Still, she said healthcare workers can help people understand what's going on. You can present this as a good thing, says Makotov. Despite the call for a more moratorium, the CDC doesn't seem likely to abandon molecular analysis as a tool. Goldfine, the Pennsylvania attorney, takes a pragmatic view. The train has left the station. She said, I applaud all the incredibly strong advocates who are like, we're going to die on this hill. We're not stopping. This has got to stop. We've got to do something different. I just don't see it happening. And then for the counter response from HIV, people living with HIV advocates, uh, Diaz of Positive Women's Network USA says advocates went on a temporary halt. Sorry, advocates want a temporary halt on the practice until community concerns are addressed and adequate protections for people living with HIV are in place. Not the complete dismantling of molecular surveillance. We're not saying end it forever, she said. We understand that that's impossible. The recent open letter calls on the CDC and NIH Office of AIDS Research to work with advocates and people living with HIV to create guidelines around informed consent, as well as standards for how officials will consult with people living with HIV when crafting future data programs. The U.S. People Living with HIV Caucus is also asking the CDC to require as condition of funding that the health department commit to end HIV criminalization laws. AIDS United, a nonprofit, has recommended the CDC require state and local health officials to certify that public health officials will only share data with law enforcement when a court orders them to do so and will notify the person whose data is being sought. The nonprofit also wants officials to help educate judges, prosecutors, and others in the criminal legal system about the science of HIV transmission and the scientific limitations of molecular surveillance. And I'm going to paraphrase just the last part of this article. Uh, basically, like folks like Diaz are more hopeful now that their concerns are being heard under the Biden administration, but they want to make sure that they aren't merely heard, but also like adequately addressed. And that's mm-hmm. where we stand with molecular surveillance. Thoughts on that? Um, okay, so I need to uh, need to bring this down a little bit so that I can understand what just happened. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so there is this new procedure of molecular surveillance. We identified what that is. I understand mm-hmm. what that is. Mm-hmm. The concerns of HIV positive folks and their advocates is that the is that the information will be used to further stigmatize and criminalize them can be used 
can be used. Mm -hmm. I, this might be my privilege talking. I'm sorry, y'all. I don't, I don't see how I, I, that's the piece. So it's just like, I guess it's just the fact that that information is exist. And though in the molecular, like when they're looking at that, that's, um, anonymized Mm -hmm. when it's in public health records it's attached to names and their concern is that uh law somebody in law enforcement can get those names and say oh this person has hiv and then in one of those states where it's illegal to spit with hiv it could be like oh shit we saw you spitting on the side of the road you have hiv you hiv you going to jail and i don't Uh think like the way that they're and if anybody like is more tapped into the space, please like, let me know if I'm wrong. Yeah. I don't think that they foresee like it being this massive, like we okay. put all you niggas with HIV spitting in okay. jail, but just okay. like something that happens a lot when it comes to like data and science in general, is just like the protections are not in place, place. and then mm-hmm. shit falls in under the cracks or whatever. Okay. So they're just like, no, we want like all this shit to be Gucci before you start running away yeah. with this. Cause you didn't even consult us before you started running away with running it. With it. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Thank you for that. Um, and I think, okay, so I definitely get it because my mind kind of went to like this massive rollout of a hall and everybody, you know, to prison. And I'm like, wait a minute, <laughs> wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's um, an industrial complex on fucking steroids up here. Like, <laughs> we lock it up all here. <laughs> um, but also I think, um, I think I didn't realize exactly what they, the, the crack that they found and that the the public health records of the city or state will say you know john doe has genetic strain x y and z and that's how they'll keep tabs of that i just kind of i went to the cdc part of like oh they just have the strain they just have the you know but like no they are because they're also using that to help supplement their contact tracing and these other epidemiological um procedures yeah got it yeah. thank you i feel smarter today <laughs> yeah <Look at this. laughs> yeah this i learned we've been doing some good hiv communication on these past couple of episodes okay. and next Yay. month is uh what is it national is it is it national world aids, AIDS month? Day. world aids day december 1st yeah. yeah yeah so there's that i thought that that was a very interesting topic i felt so uh kind of contentious reading it because my privilege also kind of spoke to me too and i was like oh this seems like a good thing for the greater good but i was like nah we really have to think about like how deeply these communities have been stigmatized and stuff like that like Mm -hmm. it makes sense for people to be that fucking scared yeah um so yeah um especially considering that these laws are still on the book on the books yeah and with laws that are still on the books so people let's say in all of these 20 states or whatever they may have never used them to you know to criminalize or incarcerate someone it just takes with that hiv one time. but they can find it and someone reading through the law books will be like haha yeah it just takes that one time here. that's like that and, amar you know, arbery shit where like the people who killed him like they did it under a legal statute that it has been around since like before slavery like before yeah. slavery ended and now they could just get off so It's really important. I'm definitely interested to see how this will be tackled countrywide, though, because Mm -hmm. do we do that anymore? Like, are we are we able to pass laws federal? Like, are we allowed to pass (laughs) that? And uh, there's just no hope for that. Should be that should be happening. Like, because it's gonna be a pot. It's gonna be a sex positive law. And I we. I know with sex positive law or things that they consider taboo or, you know, but this Supreme what, Court. Exactly. <laughs> they always like, we'll leave it to the states to have their individual decisions. Fuck off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, why are you here? Yeah. What are you here for? Um, but okay. Thank you for that. That was, um, I remember. So as we were, as I was, as we were producing, I was trying to remember which articles were mine. And I was like, I think I was supposed to do the HIV one. I started reading. I was like, oh no, no, this game. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> so thank you for taking that meaty and hefty bit of information. And, 
and I'm breaking it down for us. So I was like, oh, you're well here. That's, enough. <laughs> that's <laughs> enough. All right, let's get into our next and last segment of the day. It is called Politics. It's a segment where we talk about legislation or public officials that affect sex and relationships, LGBTQ folks and or sex workers. What do we got going on today? Isn't it a party or something? Like, aren't we celebrating? I think, see, so my little pessimistic behind, we should should be celebrating, Okay, (laughs) but I'm like, should we really, again, from a place (laughs) of privilege. Okay, (laughs) I see. So um, the city council of Austin, which is ironically the capital of Texas, Mm -hmm. I told you I've worked in class at least twice twice a day, um, they have formally adopted a resolution that condemns gender correction surgeries that are performed on newborns and children that are intersex. That's a big win. That's a big win. So I read that and I was like, what's a resolution? So a resolution is a written motion adopted by a deliberative body, such as the city council of Austin. And then myself said, what's a motion? Because I don't know legal things. Yeah, I don't know what the fuck any of this is, to be honest. (laughs) I know a bill is just a bill sitting on Capitol Hill. That's what I know. Okay, that's where it is. Shout out to Schoolhouse Rock. (laughs) (laughs) That's all I know. So if it ain't a bill, I ain't got it for you. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, But a motion is a formal proposal by a member of a deliberative assembly that the assembly takes certain. So like, think about in my simplest, in my simplest way to get my brain to see it, I was like, if there's a, I do this all the time when I'm taking a group vote and I'm like, all right, so this is what we're voting on. That's mm-hmm. the motion. And then the people who want I say I, and the people who say want nay, want nay. And then when we get to that, we write it down. So it is documented and not law, but in stone. To say. Okay. Gotcha. So that is what has happened. <laughs> okay. Okay. Makes sense. It's, um, with the resolution for condemning the gender correction surgery. So basically someone was like, hey, do we all think this is a bad idea? It was like, yeah. And then they're like, all right, so we're gonna write it down. (laughs) Nice. And that is what happened in the city council of Austin. Probably possibly the city council of New York, but we're gonna say that's what happened in the city council of Austin. Okay. They're saying you're in the the courtroom. So this resolution stands to document that the city of Austin recognizes the violence, discrimination, stigma, harassment, and the persecution that intersex people experience and formally condemns non-consensual and medically unnecessary surgeries on intersex children. Wow. This is, this is a big win, but this is where I'm like, it's not a big win because the (laughs) resolution doesn't expressly outlaw such corrective surgeries on children. Is oh, just, they're just, just like, nigga, we think that's bad. Yes, they're just Aww. saying we think that's bad. Okay. And though that is, you know, we have to think about the small wins that eventually yes. lead to the big wins, especially with everything that's going on in Texas. It is a win and it's something that I'm sure, you know, intersex people, their families, their advocates, their allies mm-hmm. um, want to hear that an actual city council, a big I don't even want to know what to call it, but like... But group of random ass lawmakers were like, let's talk about (laughs) this. We think this shit is bad. If you felt like silence for like decades and decades. And we're going to formally say that we think so. And imagine that being every city and every state eventually. I want to see that world. I want to see that world. Um. (laughs) So shout out to the city Austin, uh, the city council of Austin for that. Again, though it doesn't expressly outlaw, and I, I know that there'd be so much pushback and so much legal things if they were yeah. to be like, we are just out moving it to a bill exactly. or whatever. Can a city even do that? I don't even know. I, don't <laughs> so. I, don't know. I told you I know what bill is a bill, okay? <laughs> I don't know how to legal. Yeah, I don't know where it's the city di- jurisdiction ends and the state ends. jurisdiction begins. Exactly. Um, but this is a big win considering that the te- the state of Texas has been on a crusade as we have talked about um, extensively on this podcast, um, mm-hmm. you know, in attempting to decrease the quality of life and health care for uh, trans people and intersex people by deeming it child abuse. Yep, yep, yep. Um, to have a city in that state be like, no, we see you, we, you know, we stand with you, we want you to know that we do not agree with this. 
is a step. It is a step. And I want to start learning to applaud steps. Yes. Also, did the article say anything about who introduced it or anything like that? Like who no. advocated for it? Uh, no, and I should have did that. It did say one stank bitch <laughs> voted against it. And I was like, oh, I don't like that hoe. <laughs> who was her name? Because I actually brought up the, the city council. Uh, <laughs> let me <find> this <laughs> One bitch was like, I don't think it's any of our I don't even want to, I, I feel like I could, I could guess who it is, but I don't want to, because if it's not the person, I don't want to be like, oh damn, I thought she wasn't an ally, but she really an ally. <laughs> um, I just, okay, I want to say that the resolution was bought forth, but I don't know what the fuck a mayor pro tem is. I don't know what that means, but mayor pro tem Natasha Harper Madison, and you know, that's a black woman. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Natasha Harper Madison, District One. Um, it says only one city council member voted against the resolution because she believes Austin shouldn't weigh in on the issue. But they didn't name her. They shouldn't hmm. name her. Hmm. They don't want her to get hate stuff. Harper Harper Madison, I know firsthand the myriad anxieties and uncertainties new parents face and the fierce desire they feel to protect the well-being of their children by shining the light of dignity on an unnecessary stigma and conscientiously pushing back on misinformation. We can help more parents ensure that their kids grow up happy and healthy in an inclu and truly inclusive community. Oh, I'm going to cry. <laughs> This is the work that is being done because on the I local think, level. Please vote in local I elections. Never, I hate to be that nigga, but please vote I, in local elections. Yeah, bro. no, but this is why we need to vote on local elections because it's these small, it's these small steps that get us towards the bigger goal. And I think sometimes we're only looking at the biggest of goals. Yeah, the huge. The, oh, I'm sorry, girl. If you don't shut up, <laughs> they stood against hate though. But you gotta shut up, girl. All right. Um, <laughs> Um, <laughs> but yeah um it's I've been so disillusioned like every day I am driving down the highway and I'm just like I am praying <laughs> how do you go to better help it's your I misanthropy era I'm sitting here you know hearkening to the god of vengeance from the first from the old <laughs> testament and I'm like just just wipe it all out just let's go let's these niggas don't deserve nothing <laughs> Let's just, just come on in with the floods and the locusts. Let's just sleep it clean. Start again. See if we can do something new. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but no, um, and focusing on the smaller steps, it makes it less, um, I guess, devastating or saddening that we're still fighting. Because fighting is hard. Fighting is hard. Fighting is tiring. Tiring, yeah. Yes, and I think I think we, we fall under that, it, the fatigue of that. Often. Yeah, we burn out often. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So this episode this is going to be called "Celebrate the Wins." Yes, party. What are you about to say? <laughs> um, also, there was big hoopla because this resolution came on, I think, National Intersex Day. Mm. National Intersex Day. Mm. What else? Is it? November eighth marks intersex day of solidarity it's lit and Hold intersex on. awareness day is october 26th it's okay. definitely lit i wonder if they did it on purpose yeah they did they okay. wanted it they want to bang for their book they did. yeah and that makes sense though because i think sometimes things kind of just get lost and stuff like that mm -hmm. so the more um fanfare sucks, but yeah fanfare it, yeah. press you can drum up around something is like because we really need niggas to care. And I think sure. that um, social media is a tough spot because uh, in terms of like, and that's where a lot of people get their information from. A lot of it is misinformation, but the algorithm favors like the bad shit. <laughs> like yeah. every, I think it's every day, but at least every week I will go on Twitter and somebody will say, anybody else like hate society right now? Anybody else feeling like totally, utterly burnt out and just like feeling like a piece of garbage and it goes viral every time. And I'm like, every time. how many times you niggas gonna say this? <laughs> but it goes viral every time because like that is what the algorithm favors. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. yeah. Shout out to Diamond for uh, tweeting this link because that's the only reason why I saw it. See? <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't know this happened. 
I wouldn't have seen it because I'm not even on the Twitter. So I would not have seen it. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Nice to end on such a nice note. Yes, thank you for that. (laughs) Thank you for that. Cool. Well, I think we've done an episode about the small steps. Shout out to that female condor who's just fighting endangered okay. species dumb. She's fighting exactly. colonialization. Like, okay. She's probably out there advocating for land back and shit. Like, like, <laughs> yeah, everybody's doing what needs to be done. Well, oh my god, do you know what that yeah. reminds me of? You what? remember the um the meme where it's like um like it's a family celebration, it's like Thanksgiving, and your grandma looks around the room like I did this. Yeah. That's that female condor. She's yeah. like, oh, 900 of y'all niggas. I did that. that is I did. Shout out to Big Mama. Right. 